These scenes are from today's documentary film made during the Salem, Oregon Crusade for Christ. Salem, Oregon, in the heart of the Willamette Valley, is the site of today's Oral Roberts Crusade. At the invitation of sponsoring pastors and religious groups, Oral Roberts has brought his giant tent cathedral to the Salem area. The documentary film you are invited to see was not rehearsed in any way. The title of today's sermon is, Everything God Has is Yours. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and now it's my happy privilege and pleasure to present the man that God has raised up with a message for your deliverance, the Reverend Oral Roberts. I wish to read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, beginning at verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. I wish to talk to you tonight on this subject, everything God has is yours. Many of us love the story of the prodigal son. It is perhaps the best story that Jesus ever told, and he told it with such loving regard for this boy. But actually, he told the story of two prodigal sons, two brothers, not just one. He told the story of the younger brother who became a prodigal by virtue of the fact he went away from home and wasted his father's inheritance. He also told the story of the elder brother who was just as much a prodigal as the other was. The elder brother did not run away from home. He did not take his father's goods and squander and waste them and riot this living. But he was just as much a a prodigal as the younger boy was, although in an entirely different manner. He represents the people who ignore God, who don't take into account the existence of the Lord. To them, a God is just a figure of speech. He isn't a good and loving Heavenly Father. He isn't one we can walk and talk with every day. He isn't one we can know for ourselves. He is just a mere figure of speech. Yes, this boy was a prodigal son through his own self-righteousness. He never ran away. He never went to the far country. But where he was was a far country, for he was just as far away from God as the prodigal son was. This um, 
This elder brother uh, stirred and caused quite a commotion when his younger brother, the prodigal son, came home. You remember how the prodigal son asked for the goods that fell to him and took them, ran into a far country, squandered them with riotous living, and then came to himself in the pig pen and said, I'll, I'll return home and ask uh, forgiveness because I've sinned before heaven and against my father. He returned. His father had compassion, received him, made a great feast, and there was music and dancing while heaven was bending low and the angels were present. The elder brother was down in the fields working when the prodigal son returned home and uh, was given this feast. He heard the sound of music and dancing. He came up to his father's house, called the servant, and said, What is this commotion? What does this mean? And he said, Your long-lost prodigal brother is found. He was lost, and he's now re uh, returned home. Your father has received him, forgiven him, and made this feast for him. The elder brother's lips fell. He was very unhappy about it. So he refused to go in. The servant told the father, the father came out and said, Son, why aren't you glad? Come in with us. Help us celebrate the restoration of your long lost brother. The elder brother looked at his father and said, I won't come in. He said, that, that, that son of yours, he took what you gave him and he split it with harlots. Now you've taken him back. You've forgiven him. He said, listen, father. I've been here all these years. I've never transgressed your law. I've lived correctly. I've never asked for a thing. You never gave me anything to provide a, a feast for my friends. You've given me nothing, and I've had nothing all these years. And the father looked at him and smiled and said, Son, all I have is yours. Everything I have belongs to you. All you have to do is ask for it, believe for it. Come on in, son. Help us rejoice. Everything I have belongs to you. And the elder brother would not receive it. What was wrong with this elder brother? First, he did not know the kind of father he had. He did not realize that his father was so good. Second, his father was a man of compassion. The Bible says that he saw the younger brother, the prodigal son returning, ran, fell on his neck, kissed him, and had compassion. Third, God is a God of forgiveness. He forgave this prodigal son. He was so glad to get his soul back, his life back, that he forgot about the squandering, wasting of material things. Ladies and gentlemen, some of us put more value upon things than we do our lives. We think it's more important that we recover a lost automobile or lost piece of property than it is to find a lost soul again. And fourth, his father had plenty to spare. The young prodigal who was away from home in the pig pen said, why, even the servants of my father have plenty, plenty to spare. And God has everything we need and then some. Oh, hallelujah to his name. Do you know the Bible says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches by Christ Jesus in glory? You think of your needs tonight. Maybe you need a house. You need an automobile. You need so much money to pay your bills and to get along in the world. You need a new suit of clothes. You need this and you need that. The Bible says that God will supply that need according, according to the riches his riches by Christ Jesus in glory. The fifth thing that the elder brother did not know about his father was that his father valued the soul of this prodigal brother of his above the material things he had wasted. This is one of the wonderful things about God. God says, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world, then lose his own soul? God says your soul's salvation is worth more than all the world put together. How many of us put things in front of our souls? When you and I stand at the judgment, God perhaps will say to you and me, he will say, my son died in your place. I provided salvation for your soul, healing for your body, provision for your life, deliverance from fear, from torment, from sin, from sickness. I gave those provisions to the death of my son Christ on the cross. 
why didn't you expect them? Why didn't you accept them? Why didn't you receive them? Now, God wants us to expect. In a few minutes, I will be asking people to give their hearts to Jesus Christ. Some people will rise from their chairs and come down here as quickly as they can, some even with tears. They'll come down here expecting to change their way of living and to have God in their lives. Others will just sit and uh, sort of uh, in a daze like. They just don't seem to realize they need God. Now, when we come, we must expect the Lord to take a hand in our lives, to change things. You must expect a miracle if you want it to happen. Will you say it, please? You must expect a miracle if you want it to happen. Say it again. This is God's message to us tonight. Let every head be bowed. Now, while every head is bowed, listen carefully to me, please. And I want you to give me a chance to say a prayer for your soul that Christ will forgive your sins and come into your heart. And now, with every head bowed, take the first step, please. I want every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl who believes in my prayers, and you want my prayers, that Jesus will come into your heart. If you want me to pray that Jesus will forgive your sins, give you peace in your heart and save your soul tonight, take the first step, please, in his name right now, and raise up your right hand quickly. Up high, up high with your hands, please, so I can see you. Hundreds of hands, hold them there. Will you take the second step? I want every man, woman, boy, and girl who raised your hand for my prayer, for your soul to be saved. Take the second step, please, in his name right now, and stand on your feet for my prayer. Please stand right now. And they're getting up all over this audience. Oh, keep getting up. Keep getting up. Remain standing. Every head bowed except the people standing and you look on me. I'm glad you're standing. This is God's night to save you. We have a place in front of me here at the platform where you may come forward and stand for my prayer. Do not sit back down, but walk down the aisles right now so I can pray for you. Come on. Come on. And they're coming, coming down every aisle. I'm about ready to pray with you now, and when I pray with you, I want you to pray from your heart and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Would you raise your right hand? Now, you who are watching us through television, I want to urge you to give your heart to Christ. Let Jesus come into your soul while these friends pray the prayer with me. As you watch us, put up your hand and don't be ashamed. Lift it up and pray this prayer, these words, and give your heart to Christ. Each of you now with your right hand up, turn your face up and close your eyes and repeat after me this prayer. And you who are watching, say the same prayer with faith. O oh Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save my soul. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. Forgive my sins, O Lord, for I repent. And now I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I receive Christ as my personal Savior. By God's grace, I will live a Christian life and do His will forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you met that, say amen. amen. Do you feel better in your heart? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Brother Dewey, I want to talk with this very lovely young lady here. Who are you? Carol Stevens. And from? Estacada. How old are you? Fifteen. Do you feel that Christ actually is now in your heart? Yes, I do. How does it make you feel? Real good. <laughs> now, you're going to go to church and do his will and grow up to be his child, right? Yes. Thank you very much, and God go with you is my prayer. 
I shall be back in a few moments to pray for the sick. I want all you good friends to go out to our prayer tent for further instruction and further prayer that we may help you further to accept Christ and we wish to give you some free Christian literature. And you who are watching us through television may have our free Christian literature on how to know you're saved by simply writing me and asking for it. Oral Roberts, Tulsa 2, Oklahoma. Thank you. We've been trying now, week after week, through these television programs to inspire your faith, to be an instrument in the hands of God, to help you let your faith go to God so you can release your faith and believe the Lord strongly, positively, so that he can heal your body, so he can help your soul, so he can help your loved ones and your friends. May this be the hour. This is the hour. This is God's hour to heal you. Open your heart. Yes, we believe in good doctors. We believe that God heals in many ways, but we know he hears and answers prayer today, and he can heal you right this hour. So open your heart, look to him as I pray for these people, believe, and I'm sure God will heal your body, he will make you a new creature through his holy power. My friends, First Christian Church of Salem, right here in town. You are Mrs. Uh, Little, Mr. and Mrs. Little. Yes. Mr. Little, is he has arthritis, he's hard of hearing. It's hard to do his work because of the arthritis. Mrs. Little has a goiter, which you can see on her neck. Turn around so people can see that goiter on your neck. How many of you believe God can take the goiter from her neck? May I see your hand? Thank you. Turn around so I can touch you. Mrs. Little, how does the goiter affect you? Does it choke you? Or? It chokes me and gives me very, very nervous, and I can't sleep at night. And lately, it's getting so that I can hardly talk at times. Well, I see your voice is bad now. Mrs. Little, do you really believe God can do this? I surely do. When can he do it? He can do it right now. Touch your neck with your hands. Jesus, we ask that this swollen neck be healed. My sister, he's doing it now. Jesus, oh God, just put your hand up there, please. What? It's gone. Yes, it's gone. Turn around. That's what people say. <laughs> Who healed you? Nobody but God. That's right. And tell me your church again. First Christian Church. You know, I went to the university that the First Christian Church has in Oklahoma, Phillips University. I went to that school. God bless you. I don't want to only be healed, but I want to serve God. You want to serve God. You go and wait for your husband. Jesus, bless his hearing and make it normal. Bless the arthritis to heal it. Sir, do you have faith? I have faith. Raise your arms in his name, not your legs. Amen. Bend over and touch the floor in his name. Now, are you going back to work? I am. You feel you can now? Mm -hmm. Turn around for me so you can't see my lips. Do you hear me all right? Yes, Say, I hear you. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Take that home with you, sir. Give God thanks for it, will you? Praise God. Well, my patient brother, you've been waiting, haven't you? Salem, Oregon, your name and address, street address. Max Myers, 1195 Shamal Road. What is this disease? Well, uh, I had a prostrate condition about three years ago, and uh, they finally healed it up the use of antibiotics, and it's left me all stiff and arth in my back and legs, and I have a great deal of pain. With is it also rheumatoid arthritis yes. in the back and legs? Yes. And you're all stiff. Mr. Myers, are you saved? I was saved this evening, sir. Tonight? That's right. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> Mr. Myers, if you don't receive a healing in your body, the other is the greatest thing in the world. Right? Yes, sir. Your soul salvation. You bet, sir. I hope you'll join a good church. Going to. You're going to do it. That's right. We're, we're, we're proud of you for that. 
Put your hand on your back, sir. Yes, sir. Jesus, let his back be healed. Let his body be healed of stiffness and rheumatoid arthritis. Mr. Myers, I don't have any doubts. Would you bend over and touch that floor? <laughs> huh? You're healed, huh? Yes, sir. I thought so. You've been waiting for this. Yes, I was uh, all set to come and find you when I found out you were coming here. I haven't been able to do anything for about three years. Not to anything. For 36 months, you haven't been able to hold uh, down your work. Now do you think you can go back to work? Well, certainly. Your soul is saved. Your body is healed. You're ready to go out and meet the world and serve God, right? Yeah. God go with Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. God bless you. My sister, what's your name and address, please? Mrs. William Swift, 178 Davis Road, Oregon City, Oregon. Your two children have muscular dystrophy. That's right. Which one is uh, Billy? The oldest. Are you Billy's son? The doctor says you have muscular dystrophy and it'll be fatal before maturity. Is that true? That's right. And the little boy? He has the same, but it isn't as bad a form as the older one. Mrs. Swift, are you a member of a church? Yes, I am. Which? The Church of God. Fine. We're glad to have you tonight. Glad to have these children. Uh, how long have they had muscular dystrophy? Uh, about four years. Both of them? Yes. Was it the same time? No, Billy had it uh, about four years ago, and Larry, we've noticed in the last year. What do these boys think about coming up here for prayer? Well, they come to be healed tonight. Have they told you that? Oh, yes. Billy, is that correct? What? Yes. What did you say? What did you tell your mother about coming up here to get healed? Anything? I forgot. Ah, no. honey, you're so sweet. Thank you. Brother Deweese, I want Larry to stand here in front of me. It is true that he falls a lot, Mrs. Swift. Billy. Uh, well, I want the older son first then. Billy is the one that falls and is worse at this point. Uh, right here, son. Uh, Mrs. Swift, where do you think it works mostly? Is it hips, legs, or is it all over his body? One hip is higher than the other, and one leg is uh, more lame than the other, yes. I and see. He did walk on his toes, but the Lord has healed him from that, and he's down on his heels as far as that is concerned. So we know he's Okay, much Billy, better. when I lay my hand on you, hon, believe Jesus to heal you. And audience, help me now. Lay your hands on the back of the chair. As I asked you a while ago, open your hearts. Help me pray for us little crippled children. <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth, son of the living God, heal, heal, heal Billy Swift. Heal. Billy, hmm? you know, I prayed for you then. I asked Jesus to heal your body. All right. I was well. Billy, how do you feel now? Fine. Right this moment, I want to offer prayer for you. Just touch your chest with your hands. 
Look up to God as I ask his healing upon your body. Everyone here in the audience, remain real reverent. Now, as you touch your chest with your hands, I'm going to reach forth my hands here, and surely there is no distance in prayer. The Lord is there, the Lord is here. If he's healed these people, he can heal you. And when we receive mail every week from people who receive healing through these prayers, if you're ready, I'm ready. And now, my brother, through Jesus of Nazareth, receive your healing. Be healed by God's power. My sister, in Jesus' name, receive your healing. Be healed and set free. Oh, praise God. If you have a little child, put your hand on it. Jesus, heal the child. Heal it for thy glory and make it whole. We pray in the name of the holy child, Jesus. Amen and amen. Jesus, we pray for this child. We pray that God shall heal it and the Lord shall make its little body strong and well. Amen. God bless you, sister. We're watching you as you go. God go with you tonight. here in this particular service to tell you how to get faith, but to tell you how to use the faith you already have. In the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 3 it says that God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we see by that that faith is not something we have to get. It is something we already have. It is a gift of God to us, but we do have to learn to use it to use it in the right way and at the right time. I am convinced after my experience in dealing with multiplied thousands of people that the average person is not aware of the faith that is in him. And second, that he does not know exactly how to release that faith. I believe the average person has a rather cloudy understanding of his faith. For example, I was praying for an individual in the prayer line one evening when this person said to me, Brother Roberts, I have all the faith in the world. I replied to that individual, that's your trouble. You still have it. It's one thing to have it inside you. It's another thing to release it, to make it a definite act of faith and to believe God in a single moment. Now, a point of contact is something you do. And when you do it, you release your faith, your faith toward God. A point of contact is something tangible. It's something that you do. And you do it to attain or to receive from God his great promises which he has recorded in his holy Bible. That's why God has given us faith, to attain or to receive from God and to use what he has given us for his glory. But if God has promised us some specific blessing, force, or power, and we do not use the weapon he has given us for its uh, attainment or receiving it, we might as well not have known about God's promise in his holy word. God has given us faith. God has shown us how to use our faith, and that's my purpose in speaking to you today, to talk to you about a point of contact for your faith, how to obtain a point of contact, how to use a point of contact, how to make a point of contact something to which you cling after you've used it uh, when you uh, might reach a negative state of mind a little later on. Now, God has promised many things to people in the Bible. He's promised us eternal life. He's promised us healing for our bodies, strength and soundness for our minds. He has promised to supply all our needs according to his riches by Christ Jesus in glory. He has promised to be with us. He has promised to use us for his glory, to make our lives worthwhile, to help us fulfill our mission, to have a sense of destiny about us. God has promised us many great and powerful things through his holy Bible. But to obtain them, 
or to attain unto a certain position and to use what we have attained. To do that, our faith must be released. And to release our faith, usually, we need a point of contact. And a point of contact in the first place focuses your attention upon God. For example, I, I read about the impotent man who had been a cripple since his, his mother gave him birth. This impotent man was present when the apostle Paul was preaching in the town of Lystra. And the man was sitting down there as if to say, why don't you tell me to get up and walk in the name of the Lord? And when Paul perceived that he had faith to be healed, he cried out, stand upright on thy feet. The Bible says the man leaped and walked. He didn't learn how to walk. He never had walked. In a moment of time, he leaped and he began walking. You see, he, be, he became one with his point of contact. What was his point of contact? The words of the Apostle Paul. When Paul said, stand upright on thy feet, he became one with it. He focused his mind upon the God who was in the life of the Apostle Paul. So you, by using the point of contact, focus your attention upon God. You get it off of your sickness or your sin or your need and you turn your mind away to God, who alone is the answer to that. You focus your attention upon him. You see how important it is to make your faith or your believing a single act of faith. When you use a point of contact, for example, the laying on of hands, that's a point of contact. You use the anointing oil, as mentioned in the fifth chapter of the book of James, that is a point of contact. When you use the prayer of faith, that is a point of contact. When you use any words in the Bible or any words of a man of God, when you read these words or you hear these words, that is a point of contact. Now, when you use that point of contact, whatever it is, through it, your faith is released. Once you've released your faith, it is sent to God and the answer to what you have asked for has begun to come to pass. The saving of your soul, the healing of your body, or the supplying of some need, whatever it may be. Once that starts coming to pass, then your point of contact becomes a great force to which you cling. After you've received what you have prayed for, you hold on and you say, I will never doubt. I know that I have received this from God. There are many examples in the Bible of how people use the point of contact to receive or to attain things from God. They uh, used a point of contact to receive from God they used a point of contact to attain for God, to do things in the service of God. Moses raised his rod. The raising of his rod became a point of contact. Now, many people look upon the rod of Moses, which he raised, and through it performed outstanding miracles as a magic wand. They think all Moses had to do was just raise up a rod and suddenly the Red Sea would part or, or God would give manna or bring water from the flinty rock. But the fact is that if Moses had not released his faith when he raised his rod, nothing would have happened. The raising of his rod was a point of contact. He became one with that point of contact. When you use a point of contact, you become one with it. You put your mind on it. You turn yourself toward God. And you and your point of contact become one. So that as Moses raised his rod, he was one with it, reaching up to God, that God would perform those mighty miracles. Our hands are a point of contact. If we believe, the anointing oil is a point of contact. If we believe, the words of Christ in the Bible are a point of contact. If we believe, they are nothing if we do not believe. If you have sin in your life that's unconfessed and unforgiven, and you come to receive 
the laying on of hands or the anointing oil. What can happen? If you are willing and honest and sincere and you want deliverance from those sins, even in the healing act, you can receive forgiveness. And if they have committed sins, they shall be forgiven them. Let every head be bowed. Reverend Roberts is making an appeal for the people to make their personal decision for Christ. Hundreds are accepting this invitation and coming from all over the tent. Now they are praying a prayer of dedication with Reverend Roberts. They have made their personal decision to live a Christian life. Now they are going to a place for further prayer with Christian workers. Here now is Reverend Roberts to talk to you. I'm sure while you have been watching your television screen, listening to the message, participating spiritually here in the great uh, Tent Cathedral with us in the worship of God, that you too have a desire to dedicate to give yourself to God in a new way. Most people need to rededicate their lives. And now may I have the opportunity of praying a prayer with you. While the others remain quiet here before me, I'm asking you to put your hands together in prayer there as you watch your television screen and repeat after me. Oh Lord, I dedicate my life and surrender it into thy loving hands, knowing I am unable to manage my own life. And so I ask Christ to take control, to guide me in all my endeavors, that I may serve thee forever. Through thy Son, Jesus Christ, I pray and I believe. Amen. I think if you prayed that prayer sincerely and with faith that God heard it and has given you a sense and a feeling that's indescribable in its peace, its security, and its joy. I have a little uh, article here that I have prepared, 10 ways to know you are saved. 10 unmistakable evidences by which you will know that your heart is right with God, that you have eternal salvation. It will be a privilege to me to send you a copy of this if you will write and ask for it. It is a free piece of Christ-centered literature prepared by me, entitled, Ten Ways to Know You Are Saved. Anyone here in the audience can write for it, Oral Roberts, Tulsa 2, Oklahoma, anyone in the television audience, ask for it by name, Ten Ways to Know You Are Saved. Now, I will be, I will be praying for the healing of the sick shortly, knowing that Christ is a merciful being, that he is our hope. We know that God is merciful, that he's concerned over the healing of the human family. He has given us wonderful doctors, medicine, hospitals, nurses, and he often heals through those methods and people. We know also that God heals through prayer. And as we come to him in prayer, we know that it is not something we can do by depending upon ourselves. We must look away from ourselves to the great and merciful God. And just before I pray for the first person here today, I suggest that all of us will bow our heads in a moment of silent prayer, asking the great healing God to be in our midst. Amen. Amen. 
I'm glad to see you folks. Glad to be here, too. I noticed on your card, but before I noticed it, I had a feeling that you were a rancher. Yeah, I am. Shake, partner. <laughs> Mr. Leo Olson of Kevin, Montana. Kevin. Kevin, Montana. A rancher, you and your wife, you have a, a bad heart. Yeah, and my phosphate glands have all swollen up. My but I notice here on your card, your heart beats 120. It should be yeah. 80. Yeah. And it skips. Yeah. And the wife uh, has high blood pressure. Yes. I remember you. You working with the Indians through our ministry. Yes, Brother Roberts, I was at How Brother... How do you do? Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> I was at Brother Griffin's uh, desk when you was at McLeod there. Yes, you've been taking our literature among the Indians, right? Yes. yes. Well, how wonderful to see you. Have you had some good experiences among them? Oh, brother. Wonderful. Well, tell me one. Well, we was way north up there, where they bury them in the trees and on the ground. They don't bury them in the in ground. It freezes too hard. They don't put them in the ground. And those Indians up there, your, te your radio station on Peace River, uh, don't ever take that off. All oh, the work that that's wonderful doing in that there. Among the Indians. Oh, yes, and, and all those people up north there. 400 miles between us, full gospel churches up there. All you people who are sporting our radio broadcast, listen uh, to this. We've contacted many of those people up there that when we told them we've been in Oil Roberts mini meetings, they, you can talk to them. They hear you on Peace River. Oh, brother. That's all I got to look forward to. God bless you yeah. for being so wonderful to work. We took your literature up there, and oh, what a blessed trip we had. We oh, was amen. wanting to go this summer, but I got sick in March. All right. And I if you're healed, would you go back long. to the Indians? Amen. I'm going to go. You will go. I'm going Father, to. heal him that he may work among the Indians for Christ. Heal him! And... Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> yes, praise God. What do you feel like doing right now? Oh, I'm ready to go any day. <laughs> I've enjoyed talking with you. God bless both of you. Go with you. How do you do, my sister? Who are you and where are you from? I'm Hope Askew. You're from Japan? Yes. Yeah. Well, you don't look Japanese. I wish I were. You mean that? I mean it with all my heart. How long were you in Japan? We've been there eight years, invading territory where the gospel has never been preached before. Is that a fact? Well, have you returned home on furlough or something? My husband is still there, but he sent me home to rest. He thought I was breaking. He said, I would rather have you go home and rest and live without you than not to have you. All right. Why are you in our prayer line to receive prayer for your body? No, I have nothing physically wrong with me. I just need rest. But I wanted to thank you, Brother Roberts, for the literature that you sent to us, barrels and barrels of it. And I want to invite you to Japan from thousands of Japanese and servicemen and missionaries. How long have, have you been here? I left Japan in May. I know, but here in the crusade. I came Tuesday. Well, let me shake your hand. We welcome you here. It's a How privilege nice to, to be have here. you. I love to have missionaries visit our crusades. I would love to go to Japan. I've We'd been invited there by it. some of the Japanese officials. Your literature's been carried to many villages that never oh, had heard the name of Jesus. In fact, I put on 45 pounds of gear and flew to an island that had never heard the gospel with a young Baptist pilot who offered to take me. We found 37,000 people on that island that had never heard the name of Jesus. So we went back by ship and took a crew with us and saw that everyone had at least a tract. We don't have enough literature. Was it our tract? As far as yours went. We didn't send you enough? No, it's never enough. Well, sister, we're putting out almost one million copies a week, <clears throat> 50 million pieces a year. We must increase that. I see that now. 
Well, over there, we give out thousands every day, so there's no end to the need. God help us. God help us. Well, I'm glad to know you're in our crusade. Thank you for coming up here and telling me this. God bless you. Read the give, prayer for my Give you strength. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? We are working with missionaries all over the world. We seldom ever see them. And it's a happy surprise to see her. Robert Voigt, Pomeroy, Washington, a farmer, Church of the Nazarene. Robert is 35 years old. He's a choir director in his church. He has rheumatoid arthritis. In constant pain for five years. He has been to the Mayo Clinic. And here he is asking for prayer from this great audience and from me. Robert Voigt, have you a family? Yes, I have. Are they with you? My wife is with me. Where is she? Mrs. Voigt, raise your hand. Quickly come forward and stand by your husband. Robert, while she is coming, I want to ask you a simple question. What makes you think you will be healed? I know the Lord heals. I believe him completely. I've watched your ministry. I. My wife is from a praying family. I'm from a praying family. We just believe in God. Mrs. Voigt, what makes you think your husband will be healed? I just know that God will heal him. Do you think he will begin the healing today? Yes, I know that he will. What do you base that on? He's already started the healing. As my faith grows uh, through this campaign, I've, I've felt better day by day. And just today, I've felt better than I've felt in several years. And uh, the main thing to me is, uh, is my mental depression. Over after, this affliction? Yes, after enough years of pain, uh, I think the mental depression is probably as bad as the pain, but, but I thank the Lord that I, I have felt better today and happier, and, and uh, I, I praise him for that. Robert, we're going to pray with joy, not with begging and despair and hoping. We're praying with joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength, the Bible says. Yes, Father, I ask that you take the last pain from his body, remove the stiffness from his limbs, and heal him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Robert Voigt, disengage your arm from your wife's hands. In the name of the Lord, do exactly as I do. Raise your legs up and down. Bend over. Now move your shoulders up and down. Robert Boyd, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I do praise the Lord. Robert Boyd, where is the mental depression? It's gone. It's, it's gone forever, too. I know it is. Open and close your hands. Find one single pain or stiffness anywhere in your body. Move and find it if you can. Huh? It's gone. <laughs> I know it's good. Tell me how you feel in your soul. I, I, I feel good in my soul. I, I love the Lord. I do. <laughs> what do you feel like doing? I feel like praising the Lord tonight. Well, praise him. <laughs> praise him. <laughs> Let's all praise our hands. Raise our hands and praise the Lord. Yes. The point that I want everyone to see in this service is when we pray for the healing of the sick, or we receive healing for ourselves. Let us do it with joy, with the joy of the Lord, praying with gladness. Thank God there is a God. We have an opportunity to be healed. Glory to his name. Miss Boyd, how do you feel? Wonderful, I thank God, yes. Are you surprised? No, I'm not. <laughs> she, she had my faith for me to, to begin with. Brother, you had all the faith in the world then. I did, I had a lot of faith. Yes, you did. That's what did it. That's, I, I thank her and I thank the Lord. I thank you for your prayers. Well, God bless you. God bless you. This is your moment. This is God's hour to heal you and make you whole. Please come up here and touch my hand with yours. And let me touch yours with my hand and let me pray for you. I know God can heal you. Ready? Oh God, through Christ, by whose stripes we are healed, I come to thee as an instrument 
And may thy healing power flow as I pray. And may this friend feel the power of God. May thy healing spirit go from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Heal. Oh, God, heal. Heal. Father, I thank thee that thy healing power is flowing. Let it continue through the name of thy son, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen and amen. Now look up. <laughs>